when the show went down, it was kind of like, for me, um, there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of sadness. It was more like one really fucking big party with all of my friends there, and uh, all of my friends' bands. To be honest, the, the last show, like I had no idea what to expect. The last show was, that was mind blowing. That was crazy. There, how many kids were there? Thirteen hundred kids or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. That's just weird. The last show was basically more than I had ever expected to see out of this band, ever. When it came to our set, like, I, I was just so nervous. And then, uh, you know, I, like, got up on stage, just stretched out. And then uh, we kicked into the first song, and, like, the place just, like, blew up. It was the best reaction we've ever gotten, probably. Can you stop that stupid music, please? Everybody move up, move up, move up, move up, move up! Don't start marching yet! No, 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 move up, move up, move up!
the last show was just kind of a blur because I don't remember most of it because it was just overwhelming. And uh, the fact that Rally came out from, uh, you know, 1917 and we had some friends from Florida up just made it like, you know, that much better because we could share this one moment that was really important to all of us with uh, friends we really held so dear. Last show, I, I, I was living in Montreal, so I had to roll down with uh, Dan Edge, who uh, does size, size him up booking up here. Uh, my girlfriend Esther and her little brother. And uh, we got down to the show, uh, and I couldn't believe how many kids were there. It was insane. And the cars were like parked all the way up the street. The parking lot was filled. The line was around the building. And uh, you know, it made me, it made me super nervous. <laughs> it. Um, yeah, my parents were there. My little sister was there. She'd never seen us before. Um, you know, she had told me that she went to see Brand New like the week before, so I told her to uh, to come check out Guns Up because it was our last show. And uh, she said something to my parents like she only saw three people walk away with bloody faces, and she thought that was uh, she thought that was good. I don't know why she would think that was what an odd thing for a fourteen year old girl to say. And it, it was an amazing time. I don't think anyone expected it to be as amazing as it was. I mean, thirteen hundred people showed up. It was kind of in danger of not even happening. The venue came together like two days before the show, and the whole time was an incredible experience. When I was driving the last show and it started snowing, I started freaking out. I was like, oh, I know he's going to come. And then, like, I had to deal with the fact that the show had to, got changed like five days prior. And I'm like, oh, should we have it at the Palladium where, like, upstairs where there's. 500 person capacity and I was think I was thinking I thought 700 kids were going to be at the show max and I was like well that sucks because if we have it at the plate in there's going to be 200 kids that can't get in and I don't want that at all and then um, our friend Jeff Osmond came up to us and said that we could have it at the Roller Kingdom which was no offense to him a place that we avoided like the plague as far as playing shows just because I went to a show there and it was not there's middle schoolers wrestling like during a band and I was just like I can't I can't take this but turned out ended up being the best possible choice and if it ended up being at Lawrence Knights of Columbus it would have been a shit show it would have been awful like they would have gotten shut down for sure I drove down in a snowstorm mind you and it took me so long to get there and I I end up there and there is a line of people from the front door almost around the building. About an hour and a half into being there, you know, almost a thousand people are already there. And, you know, that just, the whole show in my mouth was just kind of wide open. And I, I kind of sounded like an idiot to everybody I talked to because, I, you know, I couldn't deal with the fact that this many people were there to see something that I was, you know, a part of. And uh, I just couldn't be more thankful. Because it wasn't Boston. It wasn't Worcester. It wasn't like anywhere else. It was just some random town in the middle of nowhere in a roller rink. And all these people came out and, and you know, showed their support. We filled a roller rink. And that, to me, is like... I mean, that's like the best thing I've ever, I've ever had happen to me in my entire life. Yo, thank you so much! I cannot tell you what a feeling it is to have all these dudes up on stage tonight saying things about a band that we started, such fucking nice things that like, I don't, I don't get man, I've just been doing this for a long fucking time and uh, it's really weird cause it's like I dropped out of school and like, I did a lot of shit to make this band happen, so this means everything to me. So thank you so much for coming out to this. Yo, it's you guys. I know you hear it all the time, but it's you guys who make the band. We don't make the band, you guys make us who we are. Seriously. This is for Riley at 1917 Records, who's out here. We will continue. Outlive. Sitting here, wearing white. No one's here to death. Well, that's me.
Bands like the Suicide File and stuff like that were just just getting started, and uh, we we're playing a lot of shows with them. But I mean, at the same time, it was just really slow beginning. Um, you know, we we play whatever shows we could, mostly around Massachusetts, uh, Kingston, New Hampshire, the Kingston VFW, and uh, yeah, Exit Twenty Three in Haverhill was uh, a really good spot. And uh, you know, you could still book like you could book a show, have fifty kids show up, and it would still be. Uh, a well-packed place and you'd still have fun but um you know that was kind of like the humble beginnings well we have became very close with josh hines alex um they kind of especially josh they kind of really hooked us up at the beginning uh, of guns up they got josh gave us uh so many shows i can't even count how many he how many shows he hooked us up with and Josh's, Josh's sister, Jess, uh, who went to UNH, set up a Bane show there the fall of 2002. And Josh got us on the show, and we opened the show. And that, that was our first big show, and it was unbelievable for all of us. We all couldn't believe it. It was such a good time. And that was our first, like, really, really big show. And then after that, we started getting close with Outbreak, uh, we became good friends with them. Like they would come down and hang out with us. We would go up to hang out with them, like outside of playing shows. Um, and then we also became friends with the band Embrace Today. And Scott and Steve Peacock took uh, a liking to us, and they really helped us out a lot. Um, they essentially put in the good word for us with Matt Pike, and then Matt Pike hooked us up with a terror show when they came to Boston once. And that was another one of our big shows. And like I think for the Valley, I think it was there was no other bands that like 
repped the valley. Like everyone was Boston hardcore, and you know, like we were we were saying it too because like if people if you say you're from the Merrimack Valley or if you're from Haverhill or something, like, people are gonna be like, where the fuck is that? But if you say Boston hardcore, like, it's just a like generalization. Like, they know, like, pretty much, we're like 20 minutes north of the city. Like, it's not that far. Listen up. There was a place called, first it was called the UFI, and then it was called Exit 23, and then it was called New Direction. Right in Haverhill. That is where, as far as I'm concerned, Merrimack Valley has come to the point where it is today. Yo, this is for the entire Merrimack Valley and New Hampshire hardcore scene. New Hampshire straight edge. I just can't tell you what you guys mean to me, so. Wave your wand and test my will. Everybody here. This is for everybody here. It's not face it yet. All in. Jimmy the Tallow. This is for you.
me come up to uh, Derry, New Hampshire, where they practiced at Ryan Phillips, the drummer's house, and uh, yeah, I, I think they let me in the band on the basis that I learned all the songs beforehand, and they liked the way that I looked when I played bass, so that was pretty much that. Um, so that was my inception in the band. Basically, I know that they started around, you know, 2002, whatever, and I actually joined this other band called The Blackout, which I know you know all about because we played with you guys a lot back in the day. So basically I got really uh I got really close to Dan and other members of the band. I'd known Mike for a couple of years anyway, but I had uh started working at this record store and me and Dan got really, really close. And he had come in and hung out all the time when uh when I was working and all that jazz. And um, it came to the point where Sean McKendry, Sean Bombs from Shipwreck and Four Bob Doles and, uh, you know, other bands, had uh, he was going to leave the band. And I was basically like, all right, well, if he's going to leave, Mike can go over to guitar and I can play bass. And what do you think about that? And Dan really seemed adamant about me joining the band and doing all that. So, And at that point in the band, like, we had done so much as far as trying to, you know, make it in hardcore, and it seemed like, you know, we weren't. And we'd been doing this for well over a year, pushing two years at that point. Um, to me, it, it wasn't really that fun anymore. And that was the number one thing for me today, to have fun with the band. And unfortunately, I just wasn't really having fun. And I, at that point, I thought uh, school was way more important than playing in, in a band that we weren't going to do anything with. So I decided to leave the band in November of, of 2003. I ended up leaving the band, um, I think it was like the summer of, was it, would have been 2004, would have been. Um, it was basically due to just um, wanting to do my own thing with uh, music and also just school kind of got in the way. It was like nothing personal. I mean, I love these guys and I, and I love this band, so it was a great experience overall. Uh, and then my uh, acquaintance of mine, Rick, Richard Newcomb, joined the band uh, when Sean McKendry left um, and set up a show with them and my old band and then just started hanging out with Dan and hanging out with everybody else and just going to the shows. And um, when Steve left, I ended up uh, just joining the band and it was kind of, it was all kind of a surreal situation just because going from being like a kid that really was into the band to uh, being a member of the band. So it was kind of weird. When I first heard them, I thought they were pretty good. You know, the demo was, was decent. It was kind of a, a floor punch type, uh, type of demo. And then, uh, the, this, you know, after a couple times of seeing them, I saw them again at Exit 23 with, um, it was a last minute show with Outbreak and Champion. And uh, it got moved to Exit 23 the last minute and they opened, but Dan actually didn't even make the show to sing, so Chucky Edge sang, and I, I just thought it was pretty funny, but as far as the music goes, it was really tight, it was really heavy, and uh, I was actually really impressed after they played, and then uh, I went outside on the street like you know most people do at the end of those shows to hang out, and Greg came up to me, and he, was, he just, as a joke, like on a, I could tell he was joking, he was like, would you uh, want to play drums for us this summer uh, for a month-long tour, and uh, instantly I said, yeah. And so like when I, we were looking for a drummer, like, 
I wanted him to play like I would. You know what I mean? Like, I knew the sound I wanted on the songs. And, like, most drummers have their own style, so, like, it was always, like, this whole thing. I was like, oh, I'd hear him playing, and, like, oh, don't do, like, bass drum in there, please. Like, don't play the hi-hat, like, in, like, quarter time. Like, it, it's awful. You know what I mean? Like, so, it, I mean, it, it's tough to find replacements for that reason, too, because Mullet was, like, a huge addition to the band. Like, his drumming style was, like, my ideal drumming style. Like, he's into the same exact hardcore that, like, that I listen to and shit. And, like, uh, you know, it's, like, it's just, the connection was there. Like, that lineup was just awesome. knows how much that song means to me truly so I songs for him
yesterday, I, I was reading the original email that Riley sent me, like, and it was he was like, hey, heard your heard your music through uh, through someone who showed it. I think it was Martine from Donnybrook and Terror showed it to him, and uh, he was like, oh, I'm loving it. He was like, reminds me of like older New York style stuff. No one's doing this really, and uh, he was like, I'd really like to talk to you guys about your plans, and I uh, gave me his phone number, and like literally the second I saw the email. I, was, I called him. I was just like, I need, we need to do this. But he found us. And the rest is basically history. You know, like, he found us. He was like, you guys are cool. You know, like, he got our demo from, like, wherever, some dude in Southern California. And he was like, I want to put you guys in a studio. I want to put you guys, like, albums out. And, you know, I want to do what it takes to, like, get you guys to be on 1917. I can honestly say we didn't really take the band seriously until, you know, until Riley came out of fucking nowhere and uh, offered us a record. So, um, I mean, that was kind of like the inciting incident in the, uh, in the epic tale of Guns Up. I mean, that's what made it all happen. You know, signing a contract with him was like, you know, it was no big deal whatsoever. And um, he really was the driving force behind Guns Up because he motivated us to do whatever what we wanted to do. And uh, he, you know, fronted us money if we needed it. You know, anything we needed, he was there to do for us. And I'm still to this day thankful for everything he's done for us. And pretty much the Guns Up, he's more of one of the best friends we've ever had than the, you know, executive of the label that we were on. You know, he just... We worked together, we grew together. He just wanted us to succeed as, you know, as well as the label succeeded. It was more of like a team effort. And, you know, to this day, I'm st I still think that's awesome. It was great. Like, he could have, he just did everything that he could for us, and we tried our best to, you know, pay him, which we never really did. We just, like, we were on the same page with everything, and, like, he was psyched that we wanted to do some touring, and, and uh, I had, uh, I sent him some demo songs that we had done, and, he was super into him, and, and from that point on, like it, the relationship just grew until we went to Atomic to record with Dean for all this is. And after that, you know, it's in the history books. Once we got to California, we had contracts to sign for the record Outlive, which at the time wasn't, you know, we had no name for it, but I had to sign a contract saying I would do an LP. And that's pretty much when Guns Up told me they wanted me in the band to play drums. So. After that tour, we came home, and uh, actually while we were in Seattle, before we came home, it was about um, a week before we were home, I called Jim Siegel, asking him if we could record at the Outpost. And, uh, you know, he was really excited about the project, so we got home, and me and Dan instantly started crunching out songs in my basement at my parents' house in North Andover. Everyone was doing their own thing when we were riding out live. We had just come off tour, and we were taking a little break, so they were all in school and shit. So me and Mullet were... Uh, Pretty much the dudes who wrote like the whole record, like in his basement, um, for like three months we just like cracked. Like it was so straight. We we like hated each other for like three months straight. Outlive was written in Mullet's parents' basement by Mullet and Dan, with help from Mike. And me and Greg had you know like certain things that we added to Outlive, you know. Outlive was a project that we get had about seven months to do, and when it came down to it, we did it in about a month, maybe. And uh, pretty much with everyone else's work schedules and uh, whatever they had going on in their lives, it was me and Dan writing the whole record. Um, he had the core riffs. We'd meet in my basement maybe two times a week. And uh, we'd slowly alter, change each riff. You know, I'm not much of a guitar player, but I think I have a good ear for writing music. So I, you know, certain things I didn't agree with, I'd hum out what I thought should be done, and then we'd change them, alter them. I'd have drum ideas, you know. Uh, and throughout that two, maybe two and a half month process, we wrote the whole record about live in my basement, pretty much just me and him. And then towards the, like when the the date came closer and closer, like we uh, yeah. we we showed it to the, all the songs to the rest of the dudes. They they would pick which ones they liked, you know what I mean? Get out of here. And um, we had like a lot of songs written, to be honest. We probably had like almost 20 songs for Outlet. And uh, so we picked the 12, or yeah, the 12, including instrumental. 
And then, uh, you know, we pieced them together, we picked parts out. Greg, Greg wrote a few parts, Mike wrote a few parts for it. Then the band came together, put it, you know, and put everything together, like took out stuff we didn't like, you know, just reworked everything. I mean, everybody had their own personal contribution to some, like I wrote some stuff, Mike wrote some stuff, Mullet, you know, did some things. And then, and then we stole a lot of stuff from other people. <laughs> no, don't say that. Uh, we borrowed some things from some other people. And, uh, you know, we had some collaborations with some friends um, that would help, that helped us out. And, uh, you know, I'm not ashamed of anything that we did on the record. It's like as far as collaborations with other people or, you know, paying homage, I guess you could say, to other bands. I, I think that, uh, I, I overall, I, I like the record. I think it was, I thought it was good. Before one, one of their last shows, Dan said that Face It would be played. And Greg approached me uh, a few weeks before the show and asked, you know, do you want to play Face It? I'm like, of course, you know, it's one of my favorite songs. I'd love to. I get up on stage. It was, um, it was a great time. Uh, I, I love playing that song. I think it's, a, it's, again, I think it's one of their best songs they wrote. And Dan, Dan uh, recognized me as one of the original members he said on the mic. And I thought that made me feel good. Uh, but it was a blast playing that song on stage for one last time. Uh, my reasoning for sitting out the Face It finale, I guess, at the last show was uh, simply because I didn't remember how to play it. It had been way too long at that point. Wasn't going to lie. Wasn't going to try to look like an idiot in front of all those people, but here I am probably looking like an idiot in front of all these people again. So. <laughs> it's been almost two years since we played this song. Sean McKendry from Shipwreck, our original guitar player. And this is Ben. This is Ben from a band called Death Before Dishonor. If you know it, this song's called Face It.
Yo, so give it up for Half Heart. First, Shipwreck. Harder to fight than resist.
Standing outside of a redwood forest in outside of San Francisco. There are no prostitutes out here or pills. But I will be looking for them indefinitely for the rest of the trip. Until then, signing off, the O'Reilly Factor on Fox News Network. I don't know, we just had a great time and I think we really learned about like who we were as adults and you know we're all between the ages of 19 and 23 and uh, is just a very very you know life explaining situation where we actually like came into being young adults on the road no supervision you know like is probably the best stuff that I could even dream of having in my life. It's just like I learned more about myself on that particular tour than ever. The first Have Heart um, U.S. tour in the winter of 04, 05 was definitely uh, my favorite tour we ever did just because it was with everybody that we ended up making like really good friends with throughout like the last you know two, three years of the band. Like, we got the name for Outlive from that tour because we were, like, driving through this blizzard. Like, I don't even know where we were. Like, right outside, like, we had just went through, like, the grapevine in, in like, Northern California and shit. We had to cancel our Oregon and, and Seattle shows and uh, drive back across the country three days straight. It came, like, almost overnight as far as, like, you know, we did our first East Coast tour. Then we did, you know, our U.S. tour, and it really got our name out there and all that. And... It seemed like at the end of our first U.S. tour that, like, bands like Us, Verse, and Have Heart had actually gotten recognition for what we were doing. None of those bands were particularly big, but they had a solid base uh, of friends who always went to their shows, who always supported them. And through always playing together, that just attracted a lot of people, and people started coming out to those, those shows and helped to make Guns Up First and Have Heart three of the biggest bands in the New England area, uh, let alone hardcore in general. Um, 
from like 2004 on. Every, like, whenever, like, Marissa's booking a show in Rhode Island, Providence, Guns Up and Half Heart played. And, like, whenever, like, we were, Guns Up was booking a show in New Direction, like, Verse and Half Heart would come up. And it's just, like, the respect between all those bands was, like, I really don't honestly think you'll find it in hardcore. Like, I, I haven't seen anything like that in hardcore since, like, New York hardcore in, like, the late 80s, like, early 90s, like, when, like, Warzone and, like, everyone used to play together, like, I mean... It's, it's really rare to find that because there's a lot of competition like in music like it's whatever you say like it's unity but it's it's competition too you know the whole year of 2005 we also played with guns up a lot we played half heart a lot and played reverse a lot and then going into th 2006 the relationship of the three bands guns up half heart and verse sort of uh grew into a relationship of four bands adding shipwreck to that group and all of the guys in those bands we're all friends. We all hung out together. We all played together. And it became known throughout hardcore that, you know, in the New England area, at least in Providence, in Boston, there was a, conne a connection between these four bands. And as it all, you know, just came together, we all just became like really, really good friends and we really enjoyed playing with each other. And every time we did the shows, just got better and better. And uh, it wasn't more focused on the fact that we all played the same kind of music because we don't whatsoever. It was just more that we all kind of came together as a group of individuals that respected what each other was doing, what each other had to say, and as far as what the, you know, the music reflected. And uh, it just turned into this you know, friendship that we all had. And we wouldn't have played any shows you know, without each other if we had the choice. You know? It's good to have a support system, I guess. So uh, you know, with us, Half Heart, Shipwreck, and uh, in Verse, it was all very, very natural, very organic. Like We just all came together. and. Um, you know, form like like Voltron, and it was um, you know it was always it was always just fun, and it was always about fun, and it was about playing good shows, and just supporting one another's bands, and the fact that like other people caught on to that, and other people enjoyed it, and other people started coming out to the shows was just an added bonus. Because I mean, honestly, we could we could have done it all by ourselves in our living rooms and still had a really good time with it. We would help each other out and like go on tours together, play shows together, um, just you know, fill in for each other. And it was just like, I don't know, it was that was just really cool. Like I, I, I feel bad for the band for bands that are out there trying to do everything on their own because it's just like that would just be really hard. Like not having the, the backbone of other bands being there to like help you out. You know what I mean? And just like get you shows and do stuff like that. I don't know. We could, we could be different and still be the same group of people. Pat Flynn, you know, gives his epic speeches on stage. Um, Sean Murphy can make people fucking cry with his songs. I've seen it. Like, it's, it's fucking crazy. And, um, you know, JD, you know, prays to Mexican gods of death and war. And, you know, we just like to have fun and, you know, play hard riffs. And I guess that's, I mean... You know, when it all comes down to it, we, we sort of belong together. Um, I guess opposites attract, and, you know, uh, I've never met better people in my, in my whole entire life. Kind of sad it's over. That's it. Yeah, I just want to, I just like, I don't even know what to say. I don't say good things. I have nothing good to say. I know we play with we play we play with verse and Sean has the most amazing shit to say and then I get up on stage and I look like an asshole. So I apologize to anyone who thinks I look like a jerk. I want to send this out to uh, just some dudes like I want to send it out to Pete and Brian Murphy, all our friends that came out from Boston. Yo, for real, uh, we all, a lot of us have family here today and shit, and uh, my mom's here and she's never seen us play, so it really means a lot for her coming out. She told me she was proud of me, and you know, coming from a mom, that's awesome, so. So, yo, this song's called On Your Way Out.
to take you into this. The band broke up because we were sick of being fucking broke and uh, it was not going to be a full-time commitment and it wasn't something that we wanted to do full-time and at that point it wasn't something that we could half-ass. I mean, there were people in the band that resented um, other people in the band for not wanting to do the, the, the full-time touring band. So when you're, when you're going half-time there's just that feeling when you're on the road where it's like, yeah, this is great. We're doing it. We're having good shows. Like the band's really picking up. It could be so much better though. If you guys would just like, you know, haul ass and make it happen. And, you know, um, as much as we all love hardcore and we all love being in a band, it's, um, you know, it's, it sucks. It really fucking sucks going home when all your bills are racked up and, you know, you are so in debt to so many people and um i totally salute anyone that can do that for any extended period of time but you know i just i mean some of us we just we did not have the will i it was my number one like priority like i mean to me there was nothing else like when i started the band like as soon as like the first kids started like giving us positive feedback or like singing along or anything like at shows that was it for me and like I was like all right I'm gonna make this happen there's a lot more that goes into a band than what a lot of people think you know and it and it's not easy you know it's not it's not like a fucking 24-hour party time like write songs and just go on tour even though like that's what it seems that's great but there's like a lot of work that needs to go into it you know and just being like one of like doing most of the work like Dan and I did pretty much everything like it was just it was it got hard and like so I didn't like welcome the end of the band so much I mean I, I accepted it and I knew it was time for us and like I kind of I kind of did want it just because I had so much more going on in my life you know I have like school and work and stuff like that so I have to focus on that and doing school work and the band was just like doing like three full-time jobs at once and it was it was just hard so the main reason i thought that we ended like whatever that we decided to call it quits was because everyone else like i think me and rick were at a point where we both i i, I think rick was like the other person he, he he i think he wanted to tour more if if we could like support ourselves off of it you know what i mean which we could have done if we were constantly touring but the other three dudes like for some whatever reasons weren't down with it and um, you know I wasn't going to go and replace like three of three of the dudes that have been in the band for years and like they're like close close friends of mine you know what I mean and uh, it's you can't replace three members especially drummer guitar player two guitar players like the chemistry in the van like we were all best friends we got along like so well I mean tour wouldn't be the same without those dudes you know what I mean and um, sometimes I think back like I'll watch a video or something of like one of our last shows and like, I mean, fuck, I really wish I was doing this still, but you know, it is what it is and I'm happy like the place where I'm at and um, like I'll, I'll start something again someday and it's, it's not going to be any, that much different than Guns Up, like I wouldn't play anything but New York hardcore style shit, like that's all, only stuff I listen to, like, you know, I heard discipline every day in my, like, my car and like, I mean, I know they're doing their thing, and hopefully they're happy. I, I really haven't talked to the dudes in a little bit, so it's hard. I haven't like, caught up with them in a while, but hopefully everyone's happy doing their thing. And like, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure we'll play again. There's no question about it. Like, it's not gonna be some stupid like corny reunion, but like, you know, it, it'll happen again. And that's it right there. I mean, that's. I mean, the the way that people went off and the way that people had a good time. I'm just glad that I provided people with a good time like that. And that's all I really care about.
That's all I ever really cared about. I just wanted people to have a good time at our shows, and that's it. And that's the end, I guess, right there. Yo, these four dudes, we've been in a band together for the last two years of our lives. This marks the end of an era for me and all of us personally. I want every one of these guys to know how much they mean to me. This is the last song we're ever gonna play. This song's called No Shelter. Watch out for the equipment, but help me the fuck out.
your band. Write songs, make a demo, make shit happen. This needs to be in the DVD. <laughs> don't put that in there. All right, don't put this on here. I wish I wasn't on Percocet right now. <laughs> That's not going on the DVD. That's not going on the Couldn't get our, I mean, I shouldn't talk shit on the band, but we just could not get our shit together. Um, everybody was naked. Yeah. I should have said, don't put that on there. Uh, we're not we're, not we're on tape. Put it on tape. Not, not on tape. tape. It shouldn't be on tape. <laughs> uh, I can't say. Ricky was just always naked. Don't print that. <laughs> Don't print that. Dick size, dick size is a major contributor to the success you experience in a hardcore band. I think that Guns Up was um, endowed enough to, um, to go out and take on America and Europe. And, um, you know, we would show up and, you know, they would see the size of our dicks. And, you know, it was... Uh, we got a lot of respect that way, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. From who? Uh, from everyone, girls and guys. I mean, um, guys wanted to be us, girls wanted to be on us. And so it's like, you know, people say things like, oh, you know, they got really big really quick, you know, it's not like deserved, it's not hard earned, but I mean, it's like, you can't really fuck with genetics, you know? <laughs> I like. Um, you know, we've always been this way. We always will be this way. And, um, you know, we don't apologize. We don't apologize for who we are. We'll poke fun at who we are. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a good time with it. But uh, at the same time, I think we're really proud of who we are and what we've done and uh, how massive our dicks are. So that's, I mean, that's, uh, that's guns up being big for you, I guess, right there yeah. in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs>